sponsored by Epic Basing. Link and discount code in the description. Whenever I asked my fellow pigment pushers what color it is they have the most trouble with, yellow is always pretty high on the list. But why is yellow such a hard color? In today's video, I want to answer age-old questions like how the hell do you paint yellow without applying 300 layers? And is there really no way to paint a decent looking yellow without the pink undercoat? Welcome back to how to paint grimdark. In this series, I'm painting miniatures in a grimdark style, trying not to rely on the typical utilities like streaking grime and oil washes. For this episode, I chose Imperial Fists because I mostly did dark colors so far and I wanted to work with a bright color next. And since Games Workshop came out with a paint that makes painting yellow really easy, I thought it would be a good idea to combine the two topics. A lot of the struggle with yellow comes from how long it takes to get a consistent layer done to work off of. But applying Imperial Fist Yellow over a white base coat makes the step really easy. And on top of that, we end up with a really bright and intense yellow. Here's the example why I don't like using transparent colors over Cenital. I was a bit sloppy with the white base coat application and it left some dark parts shining through. White leaves are very particular speckling, especially on smoother surfaces that just don't appeal to me. And since the contrast paints are only staining and not opaque, the speckling remains visible. And sure, it speeds things up, but to me, this always looks unfinished. I quickly fixed a small hiccup with a layer of Uriel Yellow that I sprayed on just enough to cover the speckling. Next, I wanted to find the proper shade color for the Imperial Fist Yellow. So I laid out a few of the new and some of the old contrast paints. You can see that we have a couple of options. Some are a bit more yellow, some darker shades of brown, some are a bit orange, and some lean a bit more towards red. All of these colors are valid options to shade yellow in my opinion. You just got to decide if you want your result to look more red or a less saturated brown shade or just the darker yellow. I decided to go with Nastro yellow and whipped out the airbrush. I thinned the contrast paint about 50-50 with AK acrylic thinner and sprayed on the shadows from below. I guess you could say that I pulled an anti senator going to a maximum angle of about 45 degrees to keep the yellow highlights as you can see here. The contrast paint still pulls in the same way it would look like when applied with a brush but we get the added benefit of really smooth transitions to the yellow. You can do this with a brush but it takes a bit more time and you will have to babysit the contrast paint a lot more. With this initial light situation established I still needed to create more contrast across all of the panels and features so I mixed a wash of snakebite leather and contrast medium. A lot of you ask me for exact ratios whenever I use these washes, but the thing is, there's no optimal ratio here because you might like your mix darker than me or lighter. My recommendations in situations like these is if you are unsure, it's always good to start more diluted as that is easier to fix by simply darkening everything with another layer of the wash once the first one is dry. And for the next try, you know that you can start a bit darker. And as you can see, that's exactly what I did on the foot here. You can also see that sometimes I correct some of the gradients by wiping away excess color from the highlights with a brush dipped into pure contrast medium. At this point, I wanted to experiment with another one of the new paints, the new formulated Fuegan Orange shade, using it as a bit of a color shift filter for the lower areas, like the legs and on the backpack. I wanted to see how well it does what the new shades are marketed as, barely staining the highlights and drying more confined in the recesses. And I don't know, it doesn't look bad, but honestly, they're not revolutionary in my opinion. You can't quite modulate the results as much as you can with these contrast washes that I'm using. Since most of the new washes are rather thin, out of the pots and don't darken the surfaces a lot, even in the recesses. And I feel like that's a problem because it doesn't really speed things up. Whenever I wanted darker shadows or panel lines, I switched to more or less undiluted Caracas sewer and try to apply it into the recesses directly. I typically do this for deeper recesses, like on the slits on the peak, or anything that is facing down and would be darker naturally from cast shadows, like here in the backpack. At this point, I decided to give all metal parts an initial layer of William Metal airbrush color, dark aluminium, and I also applied the first layers of black to the gun casing and all the straps. Of course, you can wait with this until the yellow is finished, but sometimes I want to see where the end result is going before I put in the last steps on the main cut. If this was a general Imperial Fist video, I would mix Ice Yellow and Uriel Yellow as a highlight color at this point and start to bring out the edges and some of the highlights. The lower they are on the mini, I would use more Uriel Yellow and the higher up, the more Ice Yellow I would mix in. For any of you pigment pushers that are not afraid of non-premix colors, similar results can be achieved by just adding different amounts of white 
to the year real yellow. My initial inspiration was the illustrations on the Horus Heresy box, so I started roughing up the edges with a brown shade. We quickly transitioned into a mix of gray and a little bit of brown because I felt like I didn't need the extra transition step from yellow to brown and could go straight into gray. To create the effect I wanted, I ran the brush across edges and then whenever the paint dried in a bit, I would drag and rub it across the surface to create scratch patterns, but also small specks of rubbed off paint. The more dried in your paint is, the better this works. And as always, when I try new things, I did it a bit more carefully and confined in the beginning to see where it's going and then went a bit harder. As the gray builds up on the edges, you'll notice how the readability and contrast increases. And I really, really like this approach. However, I wanted to take this one step further. So I took the mix I recommended for edge highlighting and applied some chipping starting at the edges and extending the bezel damage wherever I wanted more chip paint to show up. If you want to learn more about the proper paint consistency and other important things to do while chipping with a sponge, you can watch the video I made about it on my channel. The idea here was to make the paint look like it rubbed off only a bit initially and then exposing some kind of primer and only eventually coming off completely and have the ceramide shine through in these areas. Again, you could decide that you only want to do the gray and get some really nice looking results with great contrast and battle damage at the same time. But I wanted to combine both approaches to show you the full range of possibilities here. Well, once I was happy with the initial patterns of the chipping, I went back to the brush. I do this for a couple of reasons. The first one being I want to make the chipped areas a bit bigger so I have more room for applying the darker paint later and this is a bit more precise. The second is that I can create more variety in the patterns. And third, instead of painting dedicated highlights, I can make areas lighter where highlights would be, for example, the upper side of the beak. And last but not least, I have more control in smaller areas like the elbow here where the sponge can't quite reach and would just make a mess. If you want to speed things up, of course it's up to you to just use the sponge, but this is the way I enjoy doing it and I also prefer the results combining the sponge and the brush gives. Next, I'm filling in the gray following the patterns I established with the bright yellow paint. And you can see that I'm using a smaller brush for this because the bristles are stiffer than on my usual Raphael size one, which gives me a lot more control where the paint goes. I was using decals again for the chapter and unit markings, and I put them on in the usual way with microset and micro so Only this time, I did not use paint to bang them up, but I took a hard blunt object to scratch off parts of the decal once it was completely dry. I'm using my trusty sculpting tool here, but I recommend using a toothpick instead because wood isn't as sturdy as metal and you will have a bit of an easier time not running into the danger of scratching off the paint layer below. I just couldn't find any toothpicks in the moment. After I gave all of the decals the same treatment, I gave the metallics a thick wash of burnt umber ink. The goal was to create an opaque layer with only the edges showing. Basically, I imagine this metal, whether that's for it to look less reflective in the field or something building up over time, I leave it up to your imagination. But this is a great way to build contrast I also used the umber ink to create shadows on the underside of the rivets on the shoulder, as well as some separation between the element. And after all that was done, brought the edges out again with some pure dark aluminium. And finally, I also added some scratches and wear to the more exposed areas.
I wasn't super inspired on the black part, so I went for a relatively simple black with typical highlight patterns and edge highlights. If you want to see more options, you can check out the other grimdark videos for additional ways to paint these that also suit the style. Here I'm just going for some contrast by making sure the areas stay darker next to the edge highlights and then adding small scratch marks and wear and tear. Last but not least, I'm giving all edges facing up an extra layer of this brighter grey. Another new product I wanted to try is the AK enamel pigments. Instead of using my regular acrylics, I wanted to see if I could use them to do rust and streaks of rust. Uh, and I had a bit of a mixed result. I started by mixing the dark and light rust and applied it around the rivets. I like that they sort of flow outward and create a bit of a gradient as they spread out as opposed to regular acrylic paints. I also tried some streaking and here I'm a bit torn as it's really easy to get smooth results, especially as you can smooth out the outer areas with mineral spirits. But the end result is definitely not as bright as acrylic paint. So overall, I like the result, but I think there's probably better applications for this that I just haven't found yet. For the base, I used EpicBasing.com's new Urban Rubble set. This set came just in time for Horus Heresy, and it's really amazing. They showed what they did for a few of the flying characters from Marvel Crisis Protocol, and I was just blown away. I 3D printed all of their available elements a couple of times, so I would have some good variety to choose from, and then got to work. I knew I needed a relatively narrow base for the idea I had in mind, so I didn't go too crazy with the bigger elements. And I also wanted to use this manhole as one of the eye catchers on the base, but I also needed a feature that would stand out. The more sophisticated pre-made pillar rubble would probably be a bit too big in this case. So I built my own feature from some of the filler elements, a couple of T-beams spread out over some concrete rubble, and I used a blob of epoxy clay to hold it all in place and give it a bit of extra bulk. And then I arranged the broken concrete floor elements around that and also the manhole. Thanks a lot to EpicBasing.com for sponsoring this video. They're always one of the easier integrations since I would be using their stuff even if they didn't sponsor a video, but don't tell them. They're running a promotion where the first 50 people to click the link in the description will get a 13% discount on both physical orders and the STL files. And I don't think they ever gave discounts on the STL files before, so this is a really great deal. Their products cover a wide range of possible terrain, rock formations, trees, bushes, crystals, and magic features, and the urban set fits right in with their system. These larger features can be placed on some dynamic groundwork, and the filler elements create transitions between the ground and the features, and that feels super natural and realistic. The good thing is you can just mix and match all the elements, like you can use the vegetation fillers on your urban features and groundwork and so on. There are no boundaries here. If you like what you see, follow the link in the description and grab a discount while it lasts. To finish my base, I glued all of the floor tiles in place and filled some of the bigger cracks with smaller parts that I cut off from the bigger clusters. To fill the gaps and draw everything together, I used some structure paste. I'm using AK Interactive, but whatever you have at home works. To paint the base, I used the beige gray that I washed with dark gray to create some depth. And then I added another wash of burnt umber to add color variation and painted most of the metal elements. I added some rust colors to the metal areas and around them and painted the T-beams rust color too. And then using my gray beige base color, I dry brushed some edges again and also painted highlights on the beams by gradually adding lighter rust colors and eventually a bit of beige. Running everything out with a last layer of bright rust on the manhole. At this point, it was time to pin the mini to the base so I could add two more finishing touches. Like I explained in the first episode of the series, Grimdark to me is more than using a certain type of colors or using a particular set of techniques. It's also about telling stories that define the grim settings and situations these characters are in. And that's why I decided to add some blood to the bayonet. Tamiya Clear Red is always a good choice for blood, and I mixed it with dark brown ink to shift the color more towards realistic blood. You could also use black, just try finding a mix that works for you. Once I was happy with the shade of the color, I added some clear Uhu glue 
which allows me to create strings of blood and gore. I stirred the mix until I was happy with the consistency. It's totally okay for the purpose if it ends up a bit grainy. Our guy here probably did not conduct a clean surgery. The goal is to stir the mix until you can pull these strings. However, you can also stir too long, as you can see here, because the blob I picked up it's not sticking to the base. Don't worry, it takes a bit of practice to find the perfect middle way. And once my mix was perfect, I snapped a bit onto the base and also added a blob to the bayon. And then I pulled most of the material I added to the blade down until the two pools connected. To make the scene extra gory, I added some more of the blood to the blade and the base. But be careful, it's easy to overdo the effect. To tie the mini and its surroundings together even more, I went back to the AK liquid pigments. Particularly, I wanted to try these white dust pigments, but somehow the mix was too thin, even though I shook and stirred the pot for a couple minutes. It's easy to overdo pigments, but unfortunately, this pre-made mix did not leave any visible traces. It was kind of weird. I happened to have the exact version of this pigment in dry form, so I added them to the liquid pigments and generously slapped them on the base. I went ahead and also brushed a thinner mix of this on the feet of the Space Marine, but initially it was hard to tell how much coverage I would get with this. So uh, I ended up overdoing the effect. That means I had to brush off most of the pigments with white spirit again, which took a few steps, but ultimately I arrived at a result that I liked. The idea was that he would be walking through fresh rubble, so there would be a good portion of dust present. A, a real good portion of dust. Last but not least, I filled in the eye lenses with blue. I don't want to drag the video out too long. Most of you will already know how this is done. But if you want to learn how to paint lenses and gems like this, don't forget that I have a video that explains all steps in detail on the channel. I'll leave a link in the description. To add a tiny bit of variety to the bolter, I added some subtle metal chips, and that was about it. While I show you some footage of the result, let me just quickly mention that if you like the video, you can support more videos like this on my Patreon, which gives you access to a full catalog of online lectures about how to improve your mini painting, no matter what level you are at. It also gives you access to the Discord. These pigment pushers are already a part of our great community. Why not join as well? I hope you like this approach. It was fun to find a really easy and quick recipe for a traditionally hard color like yellow and at the same time experiment with two or uh, actually three if you combine both chipping techniques. Anyways, I hope you had fun watching. Let me know what you think of the result. Don't forget, don't be afraid, it's only paint.